fine if there is any conflict between the center and the state policies, the center policies prevail. That's a simple definition of concurrency in the constitution that we have. Under the new, particularly after 1986, national policy on education was formulated, decentralized educational planning was becoming an important activity because uh, centralized planning was found to be quite ineffective in looking at the specific needs of the individuals mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a big country of this kind. So we have district education planning which is now compulsory, micro level planning quite compulsory and as a result today for these mechanisms to be operated we have different kinds of committees at different levels. <laughs> not only at the state level but also district level committees, block level committees, club mandal level committees uh, for education specifically. Uh, the school education committee or village education committee has been one of the important prerequisites for planning now. Almost uh, every village have now a village education committee which has responsibilities of monitoring the whole system, whether the school is functioning properly, whether there are sufficient resources uh, for the school where the teachers are coming, particularly whether children, whether any children in this village are left out of the school system and how to bring them out into this whole school system. So there are quite a few uh, uh, mechanisms of decentralizing the whole school administration, particularly pri primary and upper primary education. They also look at, they don't have really funds of their own, they also look at the scope for generating non-governmental resources from other sources, particularly village, at the village level. Uh, in some states that was the most important goal, but in many states that's not really, really, really the issue. The issue is to monitor the whole system, whether the system is working or not. Now let me come to almost a clear close with a very, very quick comment on what I said. The constitutional amendment was made and it also requires a, a bill to be passed. A bill which was known for some time as free and compulsory education bill is now renamed as right to education bill. And there have been lots of debates and discussions about the right to education bill. The controversies come because presently the elementary education is not uh, free. Students are paying a lot of money and it's also not compulsory because compulsory education acts are not very well used. Students are incurring different kinds of expenditures on books, transport, etc., apart from tuition fees. Some data very quickly to show that even the poorest children, poorest children in the rural areas, poorest children in the rural areas belonging to weaker sections, particularly girls and also other socially backward sections, spend a lot of money in sending their primary school children to the primary schools, which is quite unfortunate because it's a free education that was to be provided. The research evidence has also, sorry? Yeah. This is a national sample survey data uh, collected from the households. Uh, this doesn't distinguish by gender and others, but it gives by primary and middle levels of education. And the first uh, group is the poorest group, poorest income group, and the bottom income group, and this is the richest group. Uh, quintiles perhaps many of you know. The bottom 20%, the next 20%, third 20% and the richest 20%. It's not only 20%, even if we have much more detailed analysis, we find a very, very systematic relationship between different levels of education and educational indicators. Different uh, the levels of income uh, or levels, yeah, levels of income and educational indicators. In the sense that if there is a participation rate that consistently increases, if it's a dropout rate that consistently declines by increasing economic levels. If you have attainment levels, again, that consistently increases by income levels, quite unfortunately. And uh, very without any single exception at all, which is quite uh, problematic. <coughs> yeah. I mean, the same national sample survey data also very clearly say that uh, there are quite a few important factors why children do not go to the schools. Uh, there is something which we are not able to understand that which we are not able to uh, yeah, understand what is meant by lack of interest on the part of the parents or on the part of the children to not to go to the schools but that's an important factor. <coughs> Apart from that we find the economic factors, the poverty consideration, poverty conditions of the households, the schooling costs in terms of fees and other expenditures that the children have to incur they are the single most important set of factors in, the, uh, in why 
children do not go to the schools. 24% of the respondents say that yes, that they are very, very significant. Uh, but this also could be related to this in the sense that perhaps parents do not have interest in education because they don't have the money or schooling is costly, etc., etc. But we do not know what is exactly meant by lack of interest and unfortunately the surveys do not give that information. And I would like to consent, uh, look at and compare with another one. Once children enroll into the school system, why do they drop out? They drop out for different reasons. Again, we classified them into these two sets of factors. Now, there are quite a few differences and quite a few commonalities. Both for enrollment and also for continuation in the schooling system, the economic factors are quite important. There are a large section of poor children who cannot go to the schools, and if they can't go to the schools, they cannot continue in the school system because the school expenditures are high, the household needs are high, household economic conditions are poor. That's one very clear. Uh, second, I think according, which we believe of course too, is according to the official estimates, the schooling facilities are available in almost every habitation. Every child has a school in the, in the habitation itself or at a walking distance of about 1.5 kilometers. So schools are there. So schools, lack of schools is not really very important for not sending their children to the school. But the quality of schooling may matter very much. Once a child is school, in the school, the school's ambient school environment is not very attractive and hence, or the teacher is not coming or there could be other factors which are directly related to the school quality. And children drop out before completing because of school factors. This becomes an importantly important factor compared to the factor of non-enrollment of the children uh, with respect to the school related factors. The third important, uh, perhaps you can look, look at it is, before going to the school, uh, to put the child into the school or not, is slightly more influenced by the parental considerations. If the parent is, I mean, between these two factors, between the child and the parent, lack of parental interest is more important for sending the child to the school or not sending the child to school. But the lack of interest of the children becomes more important and not lack of interest of the parents in allowing the children to continue in the schools. Once a boy or a girl is put in the school, what it says is normally the parents do not like to withdraw. But children come out because they don't like the schools or they have some other problems. So which in a sense highlights the point that this quality of schooling infrastructure in many, particularly in rural areas is not quite good. Uh, or very specific provision, very specific difference is quite often made, like uh, toilets for girls children in the rural area, if the schools are not available, then hence girls drop out of the school system. That's very important to note. Uh, the school, it has a very significant effect on the school infrastructure. So what is needed is to give this bill in a much better definition, a bill that is really comprehensive, that's really tough, and we define the terms like free education, we define the terms like compulsory education, and we define every term very clearly. How clearly? Or what, what, is, what is necessary? Now, when we say it's a free education, the interpretation until now is that it is free as long as the tuition fees is not charged. Even though that sounds not very clearly followed. But schools were free to charge any other fees. And there were reports saying that there are 25 different kinds of fees in primary schools excluding tuition fees. So students, schools were free to charge all other kinds of fees and still we can say that it's free education. That's the kind of definition that we have. So we have to really define free education, what is meant by it. And the bill define, tries to define somewhat clearly. Uh, says, says that the children should not, be allowed, should not be required to spend anything, children or parents, on acquiring basic education or, or elementary education. Really, we have to make a very, very significant and clear definition. The second, we also have confusion with respect to education, whether it's formal education or non-formal education will do, or non-formal education or the EGS type, etc. can do. It's very, very clearly defined, uh, has to be defined, which is not coming so clearly with the, in, the, in the draft bill that we have today. Uh, but it, the general consensus saying that the bill should very clearly define that it is not referring to non-formal education, not referring to other forms of education, but a good formal primary education system. Because that's what uh, universalization of elementary education means. 
At one point of time, there were also debates whether we need 80 years of education. The 1950 constitution did not say 80 years, it only said up to the age of 14 years. So whether we need really 80 years of education or we can do with 4 years of education or 5 years of education and say that we are fulfilling the constitutional directive. So it's necessary that we very clearly define that this is at least 80 years and the bill defines now. Even though there are some strong arguments saying that in many other countries this compulsory education goes up to 12 years of schooling so we better define that but that's not being accepted of course. <laughs> but there's a very strong demand of that kind. The fourth important component of the bill that is required to be defined very clearly is compulsory on whom? It defines compulsory on the part of the parents to send their children to the schools but not necessarily so clearly saying it's compulsory on the part of the government to provide schooling facilities. I mean it's very important unless there are schooling facilities provided, good schooling facilities are provided, you cannot make it compulsory. And we also have to define very clearly that we say equitable education or equitable quality education is provided to every child. And quality parameters have to be really very clearly defined. In that sense, we have to really define a comprehensive bill in a comprehensive way, in a clear way and in a tough way because the 1950 constitution did not make it tough for the government. <laughs> so the compulsory nature on the part of the government is very important to make this. And the whole discussions in the draft education bill, the focus is particularly of equitable quality. Equitable quality that should be available both in urban and rural areas. And rural areas is of course the pri priority area for two reasons. The vast sections of the students are there in rural areas and a vast system is in rural areas. And for weaker sections, particularly for girl, girl children, because that also cut across all caste, all other groups, caste, religion, etc. If you are concentrating on girls, 50% of the population is taken care of. So there is a huge focus on some of these parameters, but there are still quite a few important lacunae in the whole bill. There are quite a few other problems, but I thought um, time should not, will not permit me to discuss them. But I'll be happy to discuss any other questions or comments that you will have. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was very stimulating. And uh, we will devote up to half an hour for a question and answer session. We will open the session to the students. I found there were a number of uh, school dropout cases were there. That was because of uh, migration. The family used to migrate to different cities nearby the village, even uh, to the nearby states like Rajasthan. <coughs> and uh, they used to accompany their child with, uh, along with them, and they used to employ uh, the child with along with them. This was one of the problem. And the second thing was that the, uh, the accessibility to toilets for girls was also lacking, and that was the reason that girls were not participating in getting this elementary education. Secondly, there was also lack of residential schools over there. Sir, uh, as we talk about this uh, retention, then the problem is the stagnation. And uh, we move uh, these days to, uh, to handle this problem of stagnation, we are moving to, uh, towards the grading system. And uh, at the grading system, uh, we are ignoring uh, this uh, quality parameter at, uh, from one aspect. So how we are moving, whether we are compromising with our education quality system at one point, at the same time, at what cost we are promoting the students because it has uh, certain things at the same time. And the second thing is sir, uh, during a, uh, my field visit, I went to Karnataka. There is a village and uh, Gram Panchayat has constructed one hostel for the poor, for the boys and girls who are coming from other villages. And uh, they are providing them a free of cost accommodation in that particular hostel and they are studying in that village as school. So, how we can go in that direction, how we can implement these kind of things in other types of villages and other villages. You are talking about quality of education. Now, given my field stay in one of the driver villages of the plum district, down the field drive. But I noticed that uh, the students are uh, comfortably completing uh, eight standard. But it was astonishing that find a 10th pass student. When we uh, uh, went into deep of the problem, we found that this is because of a uh, circular or a guideline of the state government that if less than 80% of the 
of the students uh, pass, then the uh, you know in the increment of permanent teachers will be stopped, and renewal of uh, renewal of contract of para teachers uh, will be stopped. So out of fear, out of fear, the teachers are promoting students to the next standard, and that is resulting into. I would also like to reiterate that same thing that it is not only for for that particular village, but all the all the Santhal tribal areas, all the village tribal areas, unless is there a residential schooling facility, uh, since there is no there is no peer effect, the society itself is very very uh, lacks very awareness about education. Unless state involves directly and takes up the initiative of providing education from one to class ten. At least up to class ten, not eight years education, but at least ten years education. Because after ten years education, only one gets the recognition, social recognition. Only one gets article growth opportunity in career. So the problem of tribals will not because there is there is very few representation uh, of these Hindu and Santhas in Indian society. Need administrative service, need any service, and their poverty level is extreme. Due to that, they are living in the primitive. Limited conditions, everything, and the basic factor you uh, told earlier that it is education. And one last thing is motivation level of teachers. If, if, if you see the, uh, if you see, if you interact with para teachers, they just directly ask, why you will teach? Why should we teach? Because I am uh, making a lot of effort, and my colleague is making a lot of effort, is making the same effort. I am getting only two thousand five hundred or three thousand rupees, and He is earning eighteen, nineteen thousand rupees. What? Why should I make a big effort? Why should I get a greater education? Why should I interact with guardian? Uh, and all these things. I want your description. <coughs> sir, so, sir, as far as the motivation of the students is concerned, I saw that the government has provided them books. They are having books. Government has provided bags. They are having bags. Dresses. They are having. They have got a sir bicycles in scholarship. They are having that those bike bicycles. But government has not provided any chappals or shoes. They are not. So we were there on a field visit to Karnataka. Uh, we were there in the village for 21 days, and the school was one place that we regularly visited. So, sir, your slide on why children never go to school and why do children drop out? I think in, it included most of the factors, but two factors that we observed are uh, left out. One was that uh, our academic calendar is not aligned to the. Agricultural calendar that really regulates the life in rural India. For example, we found that students miss classes during the sowing season and the harvesting season. And uh, when we talk about uh, uh, holidays, it's summer holidays and winter holidays. So that time they waste their time, and then when it comes to sowing and harvesting, they go to field and miss classes. Second point is you have mentioned this point economic factors. What really translates into reality? That what we feel it is gestation period of education that is quite long for a poor person to invest in. For example, someone in urban area can afford a 12 years of education, but we expect the same level of investment even from a poor rural guy. Is it justified? And uh, the third point that even Krishna sir was uh, referring to was uh, uh, interest of teachers in uh, serving in the rural area. I will say like we should not blame the teachers. We should also look at the incentive system that's provided to teachers. Like you get same amount of salaries when you are serving in rural and urban. So why will the person choose to uh, uh, provide service in the rural areas? Like these are three practical issues I like to raise. Thanks, sir. I'm not saying that all things are, all policies are being very well done. There are all problems are being solved by the government. Uh, there are certain important governmental efforts that are taking place. Some of which are very good, but many of which are highly inadequate. So, some of the questions like uh, residential schools or schools for migrant children or toilets for girls, these are the ones on which government has very specific policies. Both central government and many state governments have policies, but the spread is still highly inadequate. Highly inadequate. This particular state, Andhra Pradesh, is one which started this scheme of uh, ashram patashalas, residential schools, long ago in 1970. That was an ideal one, which was taken up by quite a few other states, including in Madhya Pradesh. 
uh, residential schools is considered very important. Uh, more at secondary level, but also found to be important at primary levels of education. Uh, but again, that's not a big phenomenon in the country as a whole. Where we have very, very few residential schools either for girls or for weaker sections uh, at primary levels. On the, on, the assum on the assumption that children may not like to be away from their homes when it comes to primary education, but that's okay with respect to secondary education, that's perfectly fine with respect to colleges and universities. That's the reason why you have to provide a school in every village, in every habitation, which is economic, which is viable in terms of population size, etc. Now, and so there are certain issues on which the policies and the implementation is highly inadequate, but that is, that is there. But there are some issues which were not taken care at all. Uh, one particular policy that was done, that the third kind of policies is perhaps wrong policies in some sense. In retrospect, we can say that. Again, the, uh, in primary education, in Andhra Pradesh was the first state again to cancel all kinds of examinations in 1970. Uh, there is an automatic promotion policy, which is now almost throughout the country. Automatic promotion policies, uh, non-detention system. It's based upon one simple assumption, which could be right, that if children spend a reasonably good amount of time, like the minimum condition is 75 percent of the working days, if they go to the schools, they will be learning the three basic arts which is expected to be provided. And hence, you don't have to really have an examination at all. Today, perhaps you might be seeing the news that even the 10th grade, uh, there was a proposal to abolish all examinations abolish board, board and then board, abolish board examinations. Uh, this is based upon the same assumption. But that, was result, that has resulted in uh, poor monitoring of the system. The teachers need not necessarily be serious and the students were not serious. And at least there is a good section of people who strongly feel that that resulted in the deterioration in the quality of education. And the first major examination that they take is nowadays in 10th, 10th grade. In, our, in this particular state, the first examination that they take is in eighth grade, first common examination. Seventh, yeah. Here, it's elementary education is only up to seventh. So, um, uh, the non-detention system, which was based upon a good assumption, was not was found to be not really very good in terms of quality of education. Uh, but uh, there is there is some serious thinking about it. At one point of time, at least, government of Andhra Pradesh was thinking in a committee. Uh, to go back to the policy of regular annual examinations, but that was not done. This was also supported by UNESCO, again on the same condition, that exams are really troublesome for the children. Children should enjoy their learning, enjoy their stay and learn civic habits and basic three hours. You should not expect much more than that uh, in the school, school levels of education, school levels. But that's one major problem that we still have and there is no consensus among the educationists or among the policy makers with respect to this. I completely agree with one point that was made, uh, that there is a need to increase this compulsory education not up to 8, but beyond 10 and 12. I already made this point. That's also the practice in many other countries. But that's also the reason I think one of you have made very clearly that uh, 8 years of education really doesn't give you anything at all. It's not a terminal level of education anywhere. And also more because unless you have really good secondary education, which we referred to in the beginning, you have a right to live with dignity. I mean, you cannot have really social dignity with primary, basic primary education or elementary education because that doesn't give any jobs. That gives some skills, that gives some knowledge, not necessarily good skills also, some knowledge, but that's not enough uh, to live with dignity. <coughs> so there is a strong demand. Some judges have also agreed the argument that it should be extended until the age of 18 and up to the grade of 12, but that was not done in many cases. Uh, the issue again is highly controversial with respect to para teachers versus teachers. I think contrary to what one of you have stated, some field researchers have strongly come out with the point saying